No, thank you very much for coming, and it is always my pleasure to to be here in San Carlos in Brazil. It's always very, very nice. I very much enjoy working with all of the students and all of the faculty, so it's very much my pleasure to be here. So uh, I would like to talk today about uh, a carbon material we've been studying maybe for one year or so now, so-called tetrahedral amorphous carbon. And the work I will speak about today was done primarily by Romana Yarosova, she's a student from Czech Republic, uh, Catherine Munson, American student. Uh, Lars Hobold is uh, our colleague at the Center for Coatings and Diamond Technologies at my university. And I also present some data from Denisha Hamblin, an undergraduate student, and a little bit uh, of work by your colleague Nayara, uh, who joined our laboratory for a short sandwich stay uh, about two months ago. So uh, I would also like to acknowledge uh, the, the people, the agencies that support the work, in the U.S., the U United States Army, and in here, Brazil, our collaboration copies, and uh, the materials that we work with are produced by this research center on our campus. So first, I need to thank my very kind host. This picture does not have everybody, so Nerilso and Sonia are also always very, very kind when I come. They help me with many, many things. It's always my very great pleasure to be here, so I want to thank them for all the kind hospitality, even Bello. Oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> all the kind hospitality and to all the estudantes for a very, very kind welcoming here. So, muito obrigado. So I would start by talking just a little bit about uh, fundamentals of electron transfer. So in my group, uh, we are very interested in how the properties of the electrode surface, chemistry, microstructure, electronic properties, affect rates, kinetics of electron transfer at the interface. So in any electrochemical system, it's very, in English, we say heterogeneous, so solid liquid interface. And uh, the kinetics of this reaction, oxidized form, being converted to the reduced form, are very dependent upon the electrode material type, the surface chemistry, and the microstructure, the cleanliness on the solution side, but on this side, all very dependent on the structure of the molecule, the electrolyte <coughs> composition. So when the electron transfer takes place here, there's some very special interface that forms. So we try to investigate and learn more about properties of the interface and how these properties control mechanism kinetics of electron transfer reactions. This is particularly uh, important for carbon electrodes. This carbon is very, very diverse in terms of forms. So many examples, I will show you one today about uh, the, the, uh, the importance of the carbon microstructure and controlling the kinetics of the reaction. So the electron transfer kinetics and the mechanism are very strongly controlled by the properties of this interface. And so the electrode properties of the carbon that are very important are the surface cleanliness, the surface chemistry, the microstructure, as well as the electronic properties of the material. So you know carbon materials come in various forms. So uh, for many, many years, 40 years now, 50 years almost, uh, solid carbon has been used uh, in electro-analytical uh, chemistry. And materials such as highly oriented pyrolytic graphite and glassy carbon uh, have been used for this purpose. And so their microstructures are shown over here on the right side of this view graph. So you know HOPG is a nice layered structure. You have a two general sites, the basal plane here, and where these crystallites end, the edges, and chemistry and electronic properties, the electrochemical activity are very different from this site versus this site. And then you can move to a more uh, disordered material, glassy carbon, has ribbon-like structure. These small ribbon-like uh, structures are maybe 10, 20, 30 nanometers in dimension. Uh, the material has some porosity on the inside, but not purely graphitic, ribbon-like graphite, uh, graphitic structures comprise the material. And so these are all sp2 bonded carbon materials. And then there are other single-walled nanotubes, multi-walled nanotubes. So many, many sp2 carbon materials have been studied and continue to be studied for their electrochemical properties. 
So there's diamond, which is an SP3 hybridized material. It's shown down here, also a layered structure, but unlike HOPG, there's strong bonding in the this direction, Z direction here between the layer planes. So it's a very hard material, very strong bonding, very chemically inert. The surface chemistry here tends to be hydrogen terminated after it's grown, so not so much oxygen on there. And so very, very ordered crystalline material here. And then in between a pure SP3 material like diamond and a pure SP2 material like HOPG, you have these materials called diamond-like carbons. They have microstructure, it's a mixture of sp3 carbon and sp2 carbon, depending upon the ratio, more toward a graphite or more toward diamond. So the material I will tell you about today is this kind of material, diamond-like carbon, so-called tetrahedral amorphous carbon here. So it has a, a, a mixed microstructure, some sp3 bonded carbon, some sp2 bonded carbon. So I'll show you today some things about its basic electrochemical properties and we think that it's going to be a very good electrode material for electroanalysis. So one point about surface sites and activity. So here again is the HOPG material, the layered structure, the basal plane site here and these edges constitute the edge sites. And here's glassy carbon again. In this picture right here is kind of a model surface chemistry for these edges here. So carbon bonds are terminated. They have to be satisfied with some electrons from something. Oxygen reacts. So you have very, a variety of functional groups that terminate these edges. Quinones, carboxylic acids, you can have hydroxyl groups. So it's a very diverse surface chemistry. Here is an example of an electrochemical reaction on the same electrode material, it's kind of small, sorry, that you can see very, very different behavior. So this is a molecule, it's ferry ferrocyanide. It's an iron two to iron three redox molecule. And this particular curve is on the uh, edge plane. This curve is on the basal plane. So you can see how distorted the waveform is on the basal plane much, much slower reaction kinetics. So everything is the same. Material, electrolyte, analyte type, concentration. Only difference is activity of the site, basal plane versus edge plane. So you can see in this example how the particular active site one has matters a great deal. So in our group, we tried to study and understand the nature of these active sites, chemically, electronically, and so forth. So let me give you a model for the carbon material I'm going to talk about today, this mixed microstructure material, some sp3 and sp2 bonded carbon. And when we think about these carbon materials, they're very heterogeneous in terms of their structure. So we can imagine that on the sp3 domains, those sites, we might have molecular adsorption and capacitance, kinetics of reactions that are very different and distinct from the kinetics and capacitance and molecular adsorption on the sp2 domains. So what we've trying to investigate in our studies now with these molecules are how these materials, these mixed microstructure materials function as electrodes. And we want to learn more about the role of the sp3 domains and the sp2 domains in terms of controlling the overall behavior of the material. So these materials uh, have some key parameters in terms of understanding their behavior. Number one, the sp3 content. And number two, when the sp2 carbon forms in the material, it's not a uniform, there are sites, and these sites become connected if you have a too much material. So how these, in English, we say cluster, is very, very important. And then the ordering of these phases, are they graphitic or are they amorphous types of carbon? The nature of the bonding in the sp2 parts of the material are, are very important for us to understand. And then finally, I'm going to show you materials today where we add nitrogen to the material and so how the nitrogen affects the electrochemical behavior is of very much interest to us. So for my outline, I want to do three things. Show you some data about the material properties of these nitrogen containing tetrahedral amorphous carbons. Show you some of the basic electrochemical properties make some comparisons against diamond and glassy carbon, traditional carbon electrode, and then finally give you an example of how this material behaves in an electroanalytical application. So why are we interested in TAC? 
we're interested in tech because of the bottom down here. So these are some properties that you all, many of you are familiar with about diamond. Wide working potential window, low background signal, weak adsorption, uh, rapid electron transfer kinetics, often without too much pretreatment. But the disadvantage is you have to deposit the materials at seven, 800 Celsius. TAC has virtually the same properties all the way across, except this one. We can now make this material at near room temperature. So certainly no more than 100 degrees. So this means we can coat many different types of substrates, polymers, glasses, variety of substrates that you cannot do with diamond deposition. So this is the big motivation for us, this material being able to deposit it at such mild conditions. We grow these materials by a process called laser arc deposition, so-called laser arc here. The concept is shown in two diagrams. Ah, maybe we can look at this one down here. So the source of the carbon is a graphite tube. And one uses uh, high energy laser pulses, very, very rapid, onto this material as the carbon drum is rotating. So every laser pulse causes some carbon to evaporate and be sputtered from the material. This material is sputtered from the drum into a region where there is a large electric potential. So the drum has negative potential and very, very close by there's a, a metal electrode that's the anode. So when the carbon comes off the surface, it quickly gets ionized to make carbon ions. They pick up kinetic energy in the electric field and they get accelerated a short distance to the substrate. So this cartoon looks like it's a long ways away, but actually the substrate is very, very close. So the substrate is here, it rotates, it's pulsed the laser, graphite or carbon ions coming from the source end up depositing on this surface here and one makes the amorphous carbon film. So the deposition rate is a couple of microns per hour. We add some nitrogen to the gas phase here and it turns out that adds nitrogen to the film as you'll see in just a few minutes. And uh, the sp3 content can be as high as 60 or 70 percent, can be as low as 10 to 20 percent depending upon how you grow the material. So there's a wide range of microstructures one can produce with this process. So this is a process developed by the Germans. It's used worldwide to, to coat cutting tools, for example, with very, very hard coatings for, uh, well, we say in English, drill bits that are used uh, in, in, in the manufacturing of metals and so forth. So what do they look like morphologically? Here are some AFM images of films going from no nitrogen to 10 cubic centimeters of nitrogen in the gas flow to 30 to 50. So here we're increasing the amount of nitrogen in the gas phase, increasing the amount of nitrogen in the carbon. And if you look at the morphology a little bit, you can see it has very nodular uh, structure. It's not perfectly smooth. Many of these kinds of carbons have, are nearly atomically smooth. If you look in the literature, ours are not because in the process, you don't just sputter off one carbon uh, atom Sometimes you get one, sometimes you get 10, sometimes you get 50, and there's no filtration. So we get large clusters of carbon hitting the material. That leads to this nodular formation. So some of these large features are larger clusters coming from the graphite source. And so if you look here, the nodular structure increases as we add nitrogen. The surface roughness goes from about 10 nanometers to about 20 nanometers, so film gets a little bit rougher. If you look at the top view, a little easier to see the nodular structure. So you can see here some larger domains. This is three microns by three microns. So some of these are 100 nanometers or so in the size. And the number of nodules, the density, increases as we add nitrogen to the material. So you can see here we have large nodular features, a much higher density of ni these nodular features. Still, surface is relatively smooth, but has a little bit of extra roughness as one adds nitrogen to the source gas. Now, top view image again of the material that I'll speak about for the rest of the, uh, of the seminar today. That it, whoops. That is this material here grown with 10 SECM of nitrogen. So we add a little bit of flow of nitrogen to the gas. This adds nitrogen to the film and makes it electrically conducting. 
So this is the morphology of what I'll speak about for the rest of the lecture. What are its properties? Well, it has many very nice properties like I mentioned before, low background signals and wide windows, weak absorption, good activity without a lot of pretreatment. Again, the benefits are this growth at room temperature. We have many more substrates that we can coat and use the material. And we used to not know the answer to this material, but, uh, to this question, but we do now. The conductivity is fairly uniform over the whole film, which is important for, for the electrochemical use.